Remember those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does So weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail And he never We have sung of our God, Yahweh, who saves and delivers. In Cornerstone, our next song, we will reaffirm that our needs are met in him. God doesn't need us to show up with everything together. We can show up in fragility and desperation even and find that he's both strong and gentle enough to hold us. This reading from Psalm 31 voices the desperate need of the worshiper. The desperateness of the psalm, I think, is the reason why Jesus quotes it while he's on the cross. It's a submission of need and a radical claim of faith at one time and the same time. Psalm 31. In you, O Yahweh, I have taken refuge. Let me not be put to shame ever. Deliver me by your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Quickly deliver me. Become my rock of refuge, a fortified keep to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, so for the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Bring me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Yahweh, faithful one. 
I hate those devoted to useless idols, but I trust Yahweh. I will exalt and rejoice in your loyal love because you have seen my misery. You know the distresses of my life. But as for me, I trust you, O Yahweh. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who pursue me. Shine your face upon your servant. Save me by your loyal love. Let, let us together submit our needs to God, small or great as they are, and in doing so make the claim that he is the cornerstone of our lives and of the kingdom.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Monica McCalduff, and I'm one of the elders here on the board, and I have the honor this morning of leading us in prayer. I also want to acknowledge this morning that we're coming together on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Please quiet your heart and join me in our prayer as a church community. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church that comes together to worship you. We are filled with gratitude that we can come together in your name, whether regular attendees or people new or visiting this church. You welcome and love us all, and for that we are grateful. Lord, thank you for all our staff team and all the volunteers that make it possible to come together. I pray, Lord, that you give them strength and encouragement, and that they know how appreciated they are as they do your good work. I also want to pray for our missionaries, the ones local as well as those abroad. Please encourage them, renew them, and give them the strength to continue their missions, and that their prayers are answered. Thank you, Lord, that you know what they need even before they do. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, as a church, help us all to be the light that you want us to be with our family, friends, or places that we go in the community. As a church and believers, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be our guide in our conversations, our actions, and that we may let your light shine through us, not just today, but every day. Help us love one another well, and we can only do that through your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, and that through him we can know you. Lord, we ask that you please bless those without shelter, food, and basic needs in life, people in the hospital, sick at home, and recovering, praying for our congregational needs, Mark, Sarah, Lucy, Dale, Al, Linda, Dawn, Sonia, Elaine, Dave, Sherry, Dave, Patrick, Sally, Devon, and Maria. Please take a moment now to reflect and pray for someone in your life that needs to be lifted and specifically that you want to pray for. Lord, please bless and equip the caregivers that serve and support those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, I also want to pray for those situations that we don't understand, the issues that cause us grief, that make our hearts ache. Thank you for being a loving Father and knowing that you are bigger than all those issues. Thank you for comforting us. Help us to turn to you and lean on you and not our own understanding. Lord, I also want to lift up Brendan as he leads us in the preaching today. Maybe he be filled with the Holy Spirit and with your strength and power to speak the truth. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting love and unfailing kindness. We offer these prayers to you, our Heavenly Father, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Preteen, grade five, six, and seven, you get to head up with the great Michelle Jackson to the upper room. Enjoy your time there. And the rest of you are stuck with me. My name is Brendan. We are maybe almost halfway through uh, our series in Jeremiah and the great faithfulness of God. Uh, but before we get to Jeremiah, 2,500 years or so, we're going to go back um, just a little over 100 years ago. So in the early 1900s, a wealthy woman sat down in the lobby of a very elegant hotel. She was tired and weary from her travels, and she was parched. So she turned to a slender, well-dressed African-American man standing nearby, and she asked him to fetch her a glass of water. 
The man immediately went to the front desk, brought her a glass of water, and then he asked her, Ma'am, is there anything else I can get for you? The woman said there wasn't, and the man walked off. What this lady didn't know, that this particular man at the time was the most famous African-American man in the world. He was the president of a prestigious institute. He had dined with the president of the United States. He was an advisor to many high-level leaders, and he was an internationally renowned author. Yet, when a tired lady mistook him for the waiter because of the color of his skin, he took no offense. He did what was asked of him, and he offered to do more. His name? Booker T. Washington. And his mission? was to help African Americans gain favor by, uh, and standing by education, character, patience, humility, and godliness. Booker T. Washington was born a slave, and he grew up also through the horrors of the Civil War. Yet he was fortunate, and he had a chance to become free and educated, and what he gleaned in school was this. He believed character, cleanliness, industriousness, skill, godliness, and patience would mean advancement for his people. He believed that faithful humility won the favor of God and caused man to live simply and genuinely rather than always trying to impress others or get hand downs from him. These beliefs freed him from an inflated ego. It allowed this radical act of humility and service to a tired lady in a hotel lobby without scoffing, complaining, or whining. These attributes of faithfulness and humility and a desire for their people to rise up are similar to the character that we're going to explore explore today from the book of Jeremiah. Today's sermon is about a man named Baruch. It's a great name, it's fun to say, and it means blessed. Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe, the man who wrote down the book of Jeremiah, and he's mentioned in four of the 52 chapters of this book. So basically, Baruch is Jeremiah's sidekick. A sidekick is a secondary character, yet plays a huge role in the life and the success of the main character. Sidekicks often contribute a different perspective, and they fill in some key gaps in the skills or knowledge of the main character. Sidekicks in film and theater are well-loved. I think of Samwise Gamgee from The Lord of the Rings, or Donkey in Shrek, or Chewie in Star Wars, and the classic Robin in Batman. There's another classic sidekick, is a kid named Short Round in the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Likely the worst of the original trilogy, except for this character. He's an orphan boy living off the streets, but he ends up helping Indiana, and one of his best quotes from the movie is this. You listen to Short Round, you live longer. And this is basically the message of Jeremiah, is it not? You listen to God, you live longer. And since I'm a youth pastor, this would probably be a part on the message of the youth night where I'd ask a quick discussion question, and I feel pretty strongly about this, so I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to discuss this question with the person beside you. Who is your favorite sidekick? Take a moment and do that with whoever's next to you or think about it. Who's your favorite sidekick? All right, perfect. You can bring it back in. You can carry that discussion on later if you like, your favorite sidekick. We're going to get ourselves back to Baruch. As I said, he's a scribe recording important information. And in his day, uh, a scribe was, it was a reputable job. It came with a decent salary, good benefits, vacation pay, a couple of personal days. You know the goods. However, Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe. And particularly when Jehoiakim became king, Jeremiah became deeply unpopular, which meant Baruch became deeply unpopular. And being Jeremiah's scribe was by no means glorious for Baruch in any earthly way. We're going to have a look in a minute at the main passage where Baruch is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 36. You can turn there. And this is the chapter where after 20 or so years of preaching, God tells Jeremiah to put everything he said into words. So Jeremiah brings in Baruch, and he gets him to write down sermons, poems, essays. 
Baruch also gathers stories about Jeremiah, and he links them all together to create this book, which we have in front of us. And before we read the passage, uh, I'm just going to give us a quick bit of context for it. The Babylonians from the north were fighting the Egyptians to the southeast, and Judah and its people in the middle were concerned that they would be caught between these two powers. A day of fasting and prayer was called in response to the crisis. However, given the content of Jeremiah, they were likely praying not just to Yahweh, but to a number of gods. When you're in crisis, you tend to go to every avenue. But in this whole book with crisis looming, God is calling them back to himself, the one God, the true God of Israel. They were to have no other gods before them. But nonetheless, this gathering is a great opportunity for Jeremiah. It's potentially the largest congregation that he would ever get. The timing was amazing. But Jeremiah is already forbidden to speak in public, but his message was now written so it could be delivered by another. Before we open the word, I'll say a quick prayer. Father, Son, Spirit, as we dive into the Bible today, would you awaken our hearts, expand our minds, and continue to shape our lives by your word today. Amen. Jeremiah 36, verse 1. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways, and then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. God is always desiring right relationship with his people. His heart is for them. He wants them to turn back. But the people broke their covenant with God, and injustice and idolatry was everywhere. Something, these things, this evil that God would not allow to go on forever. Carrying on in verse 4. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on a scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I am restricted. I'm not allowed to go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people the scroll from the scroll the words that the Lord the words of the Lord that wrote that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and each turn from their wicked ways, for the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord are great. Baruch, son of Neriah, did everything Jeremiah the prophet told him to do at the Lord's temple. He, were, he, he read the words of the Lord from the scroll. So here we have the sidekick, Baruch, doing something that Jeremiah was unable to. Baruch goes undercover. He's carrying out the mission of bringing God's word to the masses. A quick thought of application here. In a sense, this is what we're doing in a gathering like this. Pastors and volunteer leaders are encouraging and teaching so that as the people, you can go out and continue to share the message of God where we pastors can't. There's not enough of us to go around to all of your co-workers, friends, family, schools, neighbors, sports teams. So part of our role as pastors is to equip you to find your spiritual gifts and that you can use them outside of these walls wherever your daily life takes you. And if you're not feeling equipped, please come to one of us pastors. We would love to help you find your gifts and allow you to utilize them. Now, back to Baruch in the temple. He brings the word of God where it's not welcomed which of course is rather ironic, it's the house of the Lord, but the leadership of the nation had already discredited Jeremiah's prophecies as falsehood. Their hearts were already hardened against it. Theologian Eugene Peterson has this to say about the Bible. He says, Scripture's task is to tell people at the risk of their displeasure the mystery of God and the secrets of their own hearts. Honestly written and courageously presented words in the Bible reveal reality and expose our selfish attempts to violate beauty, manipulate goodness, and dominate people, all the while defying God. Most of us, most of the time, whether consciously or not, live this way. Honest writing shows how badly we're living and how good life could be. The Bible confronts all of us in some way or another. The question is, what are we going to do with it when it does? 
We'll read on here and see how some of the royal officials and king take the news. Verse 11. When Micaiah, son of Gemariah, the son of Japan, heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the secretary's room in the royal palace where all the officials were sitting. Verse 14. Baruch, son of Neriah, went with them with the scroll in his hand. He said to them, sit down, please, and read to us. So Baruch read it to them. This is the second time in the day Baruch is reading the first 25, potentially first 35 chapters of Jeremiah. It's a lot of reading. Verse 16, when he heard all these words, when they heard all these words, they looked at each other in fear and said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. Then they asked Baruch, tell us, how did you come to write all this? Did Jeremiah dictate it? Yes, Baruch replied, he dictated all these words to me and I wrote them in ink on the scroll. Then the official said to Baruch, you and Jeremiah go and hide, don't let anyone know where you are. After they put the scroll in the room of Elashama, the secretary, they went to the king in the courtyard and reported everything to him. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and Jehudi brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month. The king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. Whenever Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with the scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. This must have taken a long time. The king and his attendants, who heard all these words, showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes, even though Elnathan, Deliah, and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll. He would not listen to them. Instead, the king commanded Jeremiel, a son of the king, Sariah, son of Azrael, and Shalemiah, son of Abdeel, to arrest Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord had hidden them. After the king burned the scroll containing the words that Baruch had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. Verse 32, so Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to the scribe Baruch, son of Neriah, and as Jeremiah dictated, Baruch wrote on it all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added. So now it got longer, so thank you, King Jehoiakim, for the extra length of this book. This last part is so interesting. The king, the man in power, attempts to eliminate the word of God. He's in direct violation of Deuteronomy 17. It's a chapter where God instructs Israel through Moses, the role of the future kings of Israel. The king is supposed to revere the Lord, hold him in high esteem. He's supposed to carefully follow the law, not cut it up, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites. He wasn't listening to anyone. But Jeremiah's words from the Lord are against Jehoiakim. He'll have none of it. What does he do? He cuts it and burns it. There's a clear contrast between Jehoiakim and his father, King Josiah. 17 years earlier, a scroll was also read before Josiah, likely the book of Deuteronomy. Josiah's reaction was to tear his clothes, repent before God, and lead the country into renewal. Jehoiakim's reaction was to tear up the scroll, laugh it off, and lead the country to its doom. Today, many people are metaphorically cutting out sections of the Bible, or sometimes the whole thing, laughing it off as myth, misplaced trust, even dangerous. This includes some Christians, and I think the reality is, I do this sometimes too, whether consciously or subconsciously, but that is not my desire. I want to be faithful to the Bible, to this word, and we want to be a church that is faithful and open to God's word, where we allow it to guide us, to speak to us, and form us. Because if we are not humble, if we do not allow the Bible to speak to us, we, like Jehoiakim, will elevate ourselves into the position of king and dethrone God from his rightful place. This is the heart posture that Jeremiah is speaking to, and the warning is the same for us today. If you continue to ignore God's word, you will find yourself under the judgment of God instead of covered by his love and grace. So how will you approach the Bible? Will you approach it with humility and an openness to where it leads you like Josiah or with disdain like Jehoiakim? 
The Bible's amazing. I read a story about a man who was a pickpocketer in New York City. He stole people's wallets for a living. One day, he put his hands in someone's pocket on the subway. He felt some leather. He thought it, that it was a big, fat wallet full of money. He pulled it out, got off the subway, went around the corner, and it was a New Testament. He was going to toss it in the trash, but for some reason, he held onto it, and he took it home, and he opened it up, and he started reading it. He couldn't put it down. That man became a prominent preacher in the U.S., the Bible transformed his life. God's word will prevail. It always does. The moment Jehoiakim burned the scroll, God knew. And he told Jeremiah to write another one with added warnings specifically for him. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And the cool thing is, God partners with ordinary people like you and me to keep his word alive. And how cool is it that a secondary character not only preserves the word of God, he gets written into the story, and we're reading about him 2,500 years later. The call of God, the call from God's word is to stay faithful. The call from God's word is to stay faithful to it, to stay the course even when it's tough or unpopular, or illegal, or looked down upon, etc. Stay faithful. This is the story of Jeremiah and Baruch. And yet, there is a point in the story where Baruch is tempted to despair. The narrative from chapter 36 carries on in chapter 45, and we're going to turn there now. So we'll read chapter 45 in Jeremiah, which says this. When Baruch, son of Neriah, wrote on the scroll the words of Jeremiah, the prophet dictated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, Jeremiah said this to Baruch, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to you, Baruch. You said to me, Woe to me! The Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I'm worn out with groaning and find no rest. But the Lord has told me to say to you, This is what the Lord says, I will overthrow what I have built and uproot what I have planted throughout the earth. Should you then seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for I will bring disaster on all people, declares the Lord, but wherever you go, I will let you escape with your life. Baruch is human. He's young. He has ambition and desires for his future. But now he's frustrated. He's afflicted by the masses. He's hiding for his life in the depth of despair. And like many young people today, Baruch had a decent upbringing, most likely, but he seemed to be born at a time where the future didn't look good. The land was shrinking. The people were unfaithful. National doom was on the horizon. He might not have a future at all. The road to success and the good life looked like a dead end. Have you ever felt like that? Maybe you feel like that now. Lots of potential reasons for it, but God understands. Look at what he says to Baruch. He says, I will overthrow what I've built and uproot what I've planted. In other words, God says, I'm disappointed too. I had such great plans for Judah, but the world is so fallen short. And then God says to Baruch, and I notice God is answering Baruch's prayer through Jeremiah. And as God is answering, I imagine that this is one of those times where as a parent, when you're trying to encourage your kid when they're feeling down, you get down on their level, you give them a hug, you look them in the eye, you have a heart to heart, and you tell them that things are going to be okay, even if they're not right now. Baruch, God says, be thankful you are alive. And guess what? I promise that I'm going to keep you that way. Trust in me, and that will be enough for you right now. You don't know the future, but I do. And I'm securing your life as a reward for being a faithful scribe, servant, and child of God. In verse 5, Baruch, are you seeking great things for yourself? That's not necessary. But rejoice in the blessing to be alive. Rejoice in the blessing to be alive. Breathe in that North Vancouver air, Baruch. Take a walk by the creek or the ocean. Smell the flowers. Rejoice because you have a relationship with God, your creator. Rejoice in the blessing to be alive. 
We don't have to have fame or great success to be great in God's eyes because guess what? You already are great in God's eyes. He proved that by going to the cross for you. He proved that by stamping his image on you. He proved that by writing your name on his hand and on his heart. He proved that by adopting you into his family. He proved that by giving you his spirit who lives inside of you. You're a citizen of heaven. Amen? Amen. These are great promises. This is our identity in Christ. And you may think the role you're playing in God's kingdom is secondary or third or fourth or fifth. If that's so, maybe you think God is disappointed of you. Maybe you think if you're doing more of this or that, then God would be happy with you. If that describes you, like I think it did Baruch, I want you to hear this. God is for you. God sees you and he's patient with you. Think of the disciples and Jesus. He spent three entire years every day with them, and they still didn't get it. He didn't abandon them. He kept pursuing them. He gave them the gift of the Spirit. The first disciples were ordinary men and women, and in 300 years, they turned the Roman Empire on its head in a good way. God desires, first and foremost, to be in relationship with you. And stay faithful to him, and you never know what God might do through you. In the church I interned at a number of years ago, there was a lady who was retired, and she ended up coming up and sharing her story. She she didn't know what to do with her retirement, and she had basically said, I can bake banana bread. And she has baked thousands of loaves of banana bread and sells them, and she has raised thousands and thousands of dollars for Christian mission. Just a very simple, humble gift. And Baruch was simply a faithful servant using his gifts of writing to advance the kingdom of God. He didn't need to be the main show. That wasn't his gift. And that isn't most people's gifts. But we find ourselves in a YouTube famous, Instagram influencer type age where you never know you could be the next sensation. God tells Baruch not to seek those things. Baruch served God's kingdom God's mission and God's plan within his gifts. And guess what? All these years later, we're still learning from him. The cool thing is, like Baruch, we all have different gifts, different talents, different passions, that if we allow God to use them, we can partner with him in ushering in his kingdom on earth with one small act of faithfulness at a time. So church, the call for us is to be faithful and to be content. But... Also be open to more. Be content with where you're at. Be faithful with where you're at. And you never know what God might do through you yet. No matter what happens here, God holds the future in this age and in the next. We can be faithful because he is faithful first. I read a story on the devotional app Lectio 365 this week, which says this, has this story. In the year 578, a Frankish princess named Bertha moved to Canterbury in the English kingdom of Kent to marry its ruler, Ethelbert. Catholic Christianity was not yet established in Britain, and Ethelbert was a pagan king, but his new bride had a strong Christian faith. So, like a good husband, Ethelbert restored an old Roman church as a private chapel for Bertha, which she visited daily, diligently praying for the conversion of her husband. For 18 years, Bertha's daily prayers seemed to bounce off the ceiling. But in 597, a mission team sent by Pope Gregory the Great, led by a monk named Augustine, arrived from Rome. Landing in Kent, they first preached the gospel to King Ethelbert, who at last, 18 years later, acknowledged the sovereignty of Christ. He gave his life to Jesus, which would be pretty awesome, But within one year, it is estimated that more than 10,000 people followed Ethelbert's example and converted to Christianity. And then, largely because of Bertha's support for mission, Canterbury became a base for Christianity in England. And to this day, Canterbury is the spiritual home for millions of Anglicans around the world. Bertha left no writings. There's no record of her ever making a public speech or exercising political power. And yet, through her faithfulness and prayer, she had a huge impact on the evangelization of not just England, but other nations too. 
Today, her prayer chapel, dedicated to St. Martin's, is recognized by UNESCO as the oldest place of unbroken Christian worship and witness in the English-speaking world. Bertha may have just thought she was praying for her husband, but she was also interceding for generations to come. The Lord heard the prayers she offered day after day in the chapel, and he used them to do immeasurably more than anything Bertha ever asked or imagined, as Ephesians 3.20 says. I'm going to invite the musicians to take their place. And church, perhaps the simplest way to stay faithful is your daily prayer life. Pray every day. Pray for something big. Pray for something audacious. Be open to more. Bertha, Baruch, Booker Washington were humble and faithful, and they found a contentment that allowed them to rejoice in the blessing to be alive, and they used their small gifts for the glory of God. And so, church, let's go from this place and do likewise. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that as a church, we would be open to your word and faithful to it, even when life is tough, even when there is opposition to it. Jesus, may we trust that you are good. And Lord, we believe, but maybe help our unbelief where that is. And Jesus, I pray that as individuals, you help us find our gifts to offer to you, however big or however small. May we use them in community to be faithful and to build your kingdom here. God, I pray, too, that we can find contentment. God, we're kind of programmed to always look for the next thing, but help us to switch that and be content with where we are. Help us to be content in the fact that we are alive in this amazing place we call home. In Jesus' name, amen. As the team, uh, as the team is, is worshiping, um, we have prayer ministers, if you would like. So Janice and Val will be over there in the corner and in the balcony. We have Craig and Wendy, if you would like prayer. Anything you've heard? Yeah. I have a home, eternal home, but for now I walk. This broken world You walked it first You know our pain But you show hope Can rise again Up from the grave Abide with me Abide with me Don't let me fall
just sung. May that be more and more true in our lives as we go from this place. So remember, church, continue to be faithful in the small things and the big things. Be content and be open to more. And our benediction comes from Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Feel free to grab a seat. Pastor Adam's got a few things for you. Thanks, Brendan. What a great reminder. Good to just root, root ourselves in those truths. Thanks for sharing that. My name is Adam. I'm on the pastoral staff team here. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I have just a few quick announcements, and then I'll let you all go. So to begin, I think we have some slides for this. There's a Youth Wrath Trevor campout happening late May. A uh, few, few more slides. We got it? No. Okay. Not, not a slide for this one? There we go, yes, Youth Camp Out, Wrath Trevor, May 26th to 28th. If you are in grades 8 to 12, coming out to that, sign up is right now, so we encourage you. It's going to be a blast. Brendan's got some great things planned. Um, let's go to the Young Adult Barbecue next. This Tuesday, we have a summer kickoff barbecue. So this is for uh, people age 18 to 25 or so. If you're a young adult, come out and join me. I'm the Young Adults Pastor, so I'll be there. We're going to have some games. It's be at uh, John Lawson Park, 6 p.m., and then we'll do a bit of a Bible study afterwards. So hope to see you there. And last but not least, Flow Soccer Summer Camp is coming up in a couple of months. Um, so if, you're a, if you have some kids that would love to sign up for that, that's, that's great. That's for them. But right now, we're actually looking for male soccer coaches. We're low on male soccer coaches. So if you're a guy and you know how to kick a ball, the bar's low, don't worry. I was a soccer coach at this like a couple years ago, and so that's... If that tells you something, there you go. The bar is low. Um, and, and we'd love to have you. We need some more coaches for that. That's it. Come join us in the lobby for fellowship. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bless you.